all you can say by the end of it is just wow. Better than food, man. Oh man, it's a good day. It's one of them life changers. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent. Great to see you as usual. And I'm thrilled because I have just finished The Invention of Morel by Adolfo Bioy Casares for the second time. And when I was in my early 20s, I read this and I was bored to shit. I was too young to get it exactly the same scenario as Juan Rulfo's Pedro Paramo. I must have read the two probably around the same time. I can't quite remember. But I, it just completely flew by me. Didn't get it whatsoever. And I am thrilled to say that now, revisiting this seven or eight years later, I'd imagine, uh, it's one of my favorite books. Just a couple of really quick announcements. On Patreon, I just posted a review of Blindness, an essay by Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, Borges was a friend of Casares, so it's a nice follow-up to this review, and you can check it out by donating a dollar or more on Patreon by following the link in the description box below. Also, if you'd like to check out a patron-only review and see what kind of stuff I've been posting on Patreon, you can head over to my website, betterthanfood.reviews, and you can enter your email into the pop-up that you'll see, and you can get access to a review of Mark Twain's short story, The Diaries of Adam and Eve, which is an excellent short story, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, so if you're interested in supporting the show, but weren't really quite sure what you were gonna get as far as extra content, that'll give you a good idea. So thanks a bunch, really appreciate it. All right, moving on. Today, The Invention of Morel by Adolfo Bioy Casares, an Argentine author. Uh, prologue by Jorge Luis Borges, of course, since they were friends. And he called it a perfect novel. What did he say? He said, Borges said, to classify it as perfect is neither an imprecision nor a hyperbole. That's a heavy statement coming from him. Casares was 26 when he published this. This review is going to contain spoilers, some, not all of them necessarily, but enough so that, you know, if you really want to get the full experience yourself, I suggest you just go and read this. Um, it's difficult to talk about it without describing the mechanisms that make it so unique and profound. So, fair warning. I don't think that you knowing what happens is going to ruin the book. I really don't. Because I believe, actually, in the introduction, there was some allusion to it, or maybe it was outright said. I can't remember. Uh, but the fact that I can't remember is just fine, because this story operates on you sort of being lulled into uh, what is kind of a boring setup initially for the first, I mean, 60 or 70 pages. Uh, I'll describe. It's science fiction, kind of. It's about a fugitive from Venezuela, from Caracas, who escapes to this island. He's on the run from the law. We don't know what for. Maybe something political, it seems to be alluded to in the end, but we really don't know what crime he's committed. Uh, but we do know that he believes, at least, that there are the police are looking for him, many people are looking for him, and everything is really risky, and he's paranoid. So we open with him on this abandoned island, abandoned island. It has a museum, a swimming pool, and a chapel. It seems fairly tropical. There's like palms and stuff and animals. But then, all of a sudden, he realizes one day, it's not abandoned. People show up, and they populate these structures all of a sudden. A bunch of them, a lot of people, like a party, like, like as, if a, uh, uh, as if a ship of aristocrats just dropped anchor and everybody showed up all of a sudden for their, for their outing or their vacation or whatever. Uh, all of a sudden, it seems, and he can't figure out what's going on. So he hides, of course, because he's paranoid. He has no clue who these people are. He has no idea if this is, if, if they're the police or if, they're, if there's some ruse going on, that, they, that they, it's a setup, it's a trap for him. Uh, but gradually, he kind of infiltrates their world and he studies them and he finds one woman in particular named Faustine he learns after overhearing conversations. And he falls in love with her gradually, and that's what the book is about. She goes to this beach all the time, and he goes and he watches her. Uh, so she, she goes to the same spot in the beach, and he keeps watching, and he watches her from a distance. And then eventually he tries to talk with her, 
and he tries to <laughs> interact with her. It takes a long time for him to realize that she can't see him. Not only can she not see him, none of these people can see him. Or at least they're not, it really messes with his head because he thinks that they are, this is what makes him think it's a trap. Like the police are out to get him or something. He believes that maybe they're just pretending they don't see him so then they can trap him somehow. Although he, he, figures, out, he figures out after a while that would be, it, if it is in fact a trap, it's so ridiculous and, and uh, uh, excessive that it makes no sense at all. It just, just doesn't even work. So he tries all these different ways to to interact with these people who seem flesh and blood. They seem real. They're physical, right? But they don't see him. And it's deeply disturbing, obviously. Also, the songs, I liked this detail, T for Two and Valencia are playing over and over and over and over again. So these people just show up out of nowhere. It's like they're gone and then all of a sudden they're there. And this woman keeps doing the same thing over and over and over again. Or she keeps going to the same beach. There's nothing and then all of a sudden there are people everywhere. They're ghosts, but they're not ghosts because they're, they're physical. They're too real. And then he sees two sons, dual sons, and that confuses the hell out of him as well. So there's all these repetitions. The leader of this group of people is named Morel, he discovers. And Morel seems to be in love with this woman, Faustine, as well. This is kind of the look of the woman he's in love with, Faustine. So Louise Brooks was a silent film actress who stopped making films, and Casares was a big fan of hers and I believe based Faustine off of Brooks. Uh, if this is not Brooks, uh, then this is, this is her look. She did the flapper look, the really pale white skin, the flapper uh, bob haircut and uh, I'm sure you'd recognize her. She was in a, a movie called Pandora's Box, which I have to, which was by Pabst, and uh, that's one that I, I have not seen, but I want to watch. I rediscovered the novel. I really discovered the novel for the first time. I got, I got into it, but it, didn't, it doesn't really hit you until late in the book. Uh, but when it does, it's like a bomb. I'm serious. And I, was, I had this feeling like I was waiting for it because a lot of the initial buildup is so dreamlike. So here's the science fiction part. They're all photographs, the people, extremely sophisticated photographs that capture not only the image, but the physical essence, the olfactory essence, all of these different things, kind of the depth of being a human being. Like a film, if it was three dimension, but captured actual physical objects, but then replayed, projected. It's a little difficult to comprehend, but Morel brought all of his friends to this island for a week without their knowledge. He photographed them using this machine that he built. So they had all of their movements recorded for this entire week. And now it's replayed by these machines on this island. And it superimposes the projections of everything in that week onto whatever is there, whatever state the island is in. If it's a different season, it doesn't matter. It, 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 it projects the, the image of this season. It's like superimposed onto it, sort of. We all learn this from the man's diary. He's, he, he's written a diary. That's the way the novel is structured. It's in this man's diary, The Fugitive. What's really curious is the man comes to realize that the machine itself is powered by the tides around the island. So it's these tides that are controlling this machine, which projects this image of these all too real ghosts or sort of strange remnants of people, but more than remnants, it's so bizarre. And so it has that poetic quality, you know, the tides controlling the machine, controlling the images. And, and there are these all encompassing photographs. So this week that they spent together is playing for eternity. And he, the fugitive, is outside of it, even though he is in love with this woman. They exist in the same world, 
but in different worlds. But what if he wasn't? What if he could infiltrate that world somehow? And that's as much as I'm going to give away, because what he does in the end is fascinating and tragic and beautiful and a little bit of a, <laughs> not just a little bit, a complete and total mindfuck. All you can say by the end of it is just, wow, incredible. So, being a friend of Borges leads to possibly ideas like this. I'd love to know more about their relationship and the, the conversations that they had. They are two very unique, brilliant literary minds. So many questions are asked in this novella. I mean, what's in a photograph? Can you photograph a soul? Can you capture the essence of a person? If you had enough information, enough facets of somebody's personality captured on film, you know, and it's very strange to be saying this into a camera, of course. I recognize the, the, you know. So if you had enough of that, could you recreate in some fashion the person, the essence of the person, uh, like a ghost, but more real than a ghost? Could you really recreate them? How much, you know, could you, can you capture consciousness? What is consciousness for one? And can it be captured using some sort of photographic device? In this era of technology and in the era of celebrity where you have this cultivated lifestyle image and I'm guilty of it as well of course I'm fully aware that I'm a part of that you know these are this is a fascinating question so it's a little bit it's maybe I don't know if you'd call it prophetic but certainly the the, the philosophical element is just as fascinating today and relevant. So, Burdain's suicide recently, I, that's been on my mind of course this last week, and there's somebody who is all over the globe and captured in cinematic form for however long, what, you know, so what does that mean? You know, if you are influencing the world and inspiring people beyond the grave in cinematic form with all of your movements and your, your, the facets of your personality captured, how dead are you? Can you capture something more than the surface image even though it doesn't seem like it? It sure seems that you can to some degree because it's so, all these films are so influential. So it's not just surface images, you know, these things are echoing throughout history. And we've only had film for what, less than, I mean, I don't know, what, uh, a century and change. So, so, so we don't really know the full effects of it. And we especially don't know the full effects of cinema combined with, uh, or cinema or moving images combined with the internet. Because what's the longevity of all of this stuff? Eternity? Yes, we all die and the flesh rots away and disintegrates, but what if you've been captured on film, like your whole life, or at least a good portion of your life? How much of you lives on? How much of you is truly revealed, can be truly revealed? How much of you really dies? I never asked that question. It's a scary question, kind of, because in some sense, you don't have control over your own, you know, you don't have control over yourself anymore. And you could look at that with social media, you can look at that with YouTube, with, with Twitter or Instagram or any of this, uh, you know, how much of you, you're giving yourself away. So that whole thing, which I think he actually brings up in here, you know, the, the um, certain cultures are afraid of having their photograph taken because they believe it will steal a part of their soul. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but that's, that's sort of the idea. Well, that's not really superstitious. It's sort of true. You do steal a part of somebody's soul. You do. Because it's not theirs anymore. Because it can be replicated ad nauseum now. So think about that. You know? You're not in control of your own fate in that regard any longer. Good or bad? I'm not sure. What do you think? Could it be that if enough of you was captured, there was a part of you, in essence, the most complete part that was knowable throughout your existent lifespan to the people that you knew within that period of time that lives on 
forever. What are the limits of this? Yes, actors die, films vanish, but they also don't. Some of them live on, they continue to influence. They don't quite stop or give up, really. Can consciousness be created or destroyed? It seems that access to consciousness can, but can consciousness itself be replicated? The thing itself, us, is it really unto itself? Or if not, how much? The tragic thing he realizes is that he's in love with a ghost. But worse than that, it's not even a ghost because they don't even exist in the same world. It's, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> he's in love with an image, basically. He doesn't know if she's alive or dead. He doesn't know where she exists except here. And she does, but she also fundamentally does not. But then how different is that from reality? Uh, what if you were to play along? Finally, he grows accustomed to living with the images, the images of all these people and the woman that he loves. It is a stroke of luck to be able to live with the images. If my pursuers should come, they will forget about me when they see these prodigious, inaccessible people, and so I shall stay here. If I should find Faustine, how she would laugh when I told her about the many times I have talked to her image with tenderness and desperation. But I feel that I should not entertain this thought, and I have written it down merely to set a limit, to see that it holds no charm for me, to abandon it. A rotating eternity may seem atrocious to an observer, but it is quite acceptable to those who dwell there. Free from bad news and disease, they live forever as if each thing were happening for the first time. They have no memory of anything that happened before, and the interruptions caused by the rhythm of the tides keep the repetition from being implacable. Now that I have grown accustomed to seeing a life that is repeated, I find my own irreparably haphazard. My plans to alter the situation are useless. I have no next time. Each moment is unique, different from every other moment, and many are wasted by my own indolence. Of course, there is no next time for the images either. Each moment follows the pattern set when the eternal week was first recorded. Our life may be thought of as a week of these images, one that may be repeated in adjoining worlds. Man. If there is a peaceful eternity in the repeated week, isn't that what we're all striving for? As suggested by my kind stranger with a pencil. You see, initially I was irritated because I bought this book off of Amazon and I thought I chose the, you know, the like new condition, but I opened it up and I was perturbed because there were little notes everywhere in, in pencil. And I was like, oh, this is awful. I want to send it back. But then I, I read the notes and then some of the ideas were very interesting. And then some of the lines that they were, they had uh, underlined were helpful because they were very interesting lines and they even had little notes by them occasionally or little, little words maybe. I loved it. Now here's this crazy thing. While I'm writing this review, I jump onto Airbnb as a distraction because I'm thinking about Casares and I'm thinking about traveling and I wanna go to Buenos Aires one day because I've never been to Argentina. The first one I click on, the first Airbnb listing in Buenos Aires that I clicked on was a loft previously owned by Casares. The first one I clicked on. You can check it out in the description box below. You can go stay in his, where he lived with Silvino Ocampo. They, he even, the, the host even has this book and Borges for you to read. So I was going to talk a little bit about Adolfo near the beginning, but I got so excited and I just went off on this story. But Adolfo B.O.A. Casares was born into a wealthy family, so he was able to focus on literature quite a bit. He was fluent in something like four languages uh, in his late 20s, I believe, according to Wikipedia. And he was a friend of Borges. He was a friend of Borges and he published this when he was 26 years old, which blows my mind. It's unbelievable. Nora, uh, Jorge's sister, did the illustrations for this book. These really cool black and white illustrations. Also those dual suns, it, I believe it has something to do with the projection of the week that was recorded. That's why there's two of them, because this week keeps playing over and over, so when it does, there are two suns. Uh, I think that's, I think I have it right. It's a little bit confusing. It's kind of a stretch. It is this strange, it, so much of the book has to do with kind of structures and architectural structures. 
he describes all of the different places in the island in the first maybe 50 pages or so, it seems like, and that's what really bored me so much. It was really, really, really dull because I couldn't see where it was all going. And this time too, I was just like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But then eventually it, it all started to kind of cement. And like I said, there was this one line uh, when he revealed that they were photographs that just, it was a bomb dropping and I flew to the laptop and I just like listed down all these things to, to speak about in the review. So if you get anxious or bored, I mean, for the first half of the book, don't worry about it. It gets, I mean, it's all part of the device. It's all part of the machine. It's working as it should. Um, it's very Lynchian, very slow. It's not boring, it's just slow, it's just slow right? Uh, so if you, if you loved Mulholland Drive or anything Twin Peaks, this is Last Year at Marienbad by Rene, the director, the French, the French filmmaker. Uh, Alain, Alain, Alain Rene, Alain Rene, I think. Uh, it was inspired by this. It was inspired by the invention of Morel. So it's science fiction mystery philosophy. It's a perfect perfect novella. So if you're a fan of Cortázar, if you're a fan of Roberto Bolaño, if you're a fan of César Ayra, if you're a fan of Ernesto Sabato, if you're a fan of uh, Kafka, if you're a fan of, uh, of course, the one and only Borges, this is absolutely for you. Uh, if you're a fan of any of those, anything surrealist, anything dreamlike or, or ethereal, philosophical, if you like good science fiction, if you like cerebral science fiction, if you like um, mind puzzles, uh, then I highly recommend you get it. So, Coffee Lottery, who's going to get this magnificent book, which I am happy, sad and happy to part with, but uh, very happy that somebody's gonna get the experience, hopefully for the first time. For those of you who are new, the Coffee and Book Lottery is where I take uh, all the names of the patrons who have donated $5 or more per video on Patreon. Those patrons' names are placed into this mason jar, and I draw a name out of the mason jar for every review. And whoever's name I draw, they are sent a hard copy of the book and a bag of coffee that I roast myself. The books are awesome and the coffee is delicious. Best of luck to all the patrons who have helped support the show. I could not do this without you. I sincerely appreciate it. If you would like to get in on that and support the channel, please go to the description box below and get the link. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. Thank you very much. Here we go. Who's gonna get The Invention of Morel by Adolfo Bioe Casares? Reed. Thanks, Reed. You will be reading The Invention of Morel soon enough and drinking some delicious coffee. If you'd be so kind as to go and give me a like on Facebook or find me on Twitter or Instagram and interact in some way, a follow would be nice. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Would really appreciate it. I always love book recommendations. Um, you can mail me books if you like. I always accept gifts. It's more than kind of you. It's extremely generous. Some folks like to do that and I, I'm always happy to take them. Um, though not if it's just you trying to get me to review your book. Uh, no offense or anything, I just have a, a big giant shelf full of them and I sort of have to be really diligent with my time management uh, as there's a, a limited amount of time, unfortunately. And th that book, this book, really brings that into perspective as well. One of the final tragic things I'll say about it, you know, just the, uh, the, the shortness of life and maybe, maybe the shortness of just how many moments we are, we are really happy, you know, really um, engaged and, and living in the present uh, and in love or, or uh, appreciative or, I don't know, time, time just makes you think about time and it's so disturbing, you know, the same week playing out forever, a small span of time. What is time? What does it all mean? What is life? What is death? What is consciousness? What, are, what is love? Uh, what are any of these things? Better than food, what more can I say? So please live the rest of your life as well as you can and always remember, die reading. Great to see you as usual. Thank you for watching. Take care of yourselves and have a good night. Ciao.